Energy Solutions Group, Incorporated. We'll hear first from Mr. Kurt Hesse. May it please the court. Blackjack dealers, croupiers, bartenders, waiters, cable TV repairmen, and cowboys tending livestock. Those are all workers who, according to the district court, were seamen exempt from the maximum hour requirements of the Fair Labor Standards Act if they performed work on seagoing vessels. The law, though, is decidedly different. Section 13b6 of the act exempts only those employees actually employed as seamen. <clears throat> May I ask, the, the district court did not have the benefit of the Adams case, and should this case be remanded for the district court to look at this case in light of the standards that the court has articulated? Is that what we should do here? Your, Your Honor, uh, Adams certainly um, is informative and it helps the, the arguments. Is it controlling? Yes, Judge, it is. If it's controlling and the district court didn't have the benefit of it, should we just remand and say, please take a look at this case that you didn't get to see? Um, ordinarily, I would agree with you, Your Honor, but... Well, I'm not saying that's my point. That I, please, You don't need to agree or disagree with me. I'm just asking that question. So The, the case should absolutely be re remanded, Judge, but um, the arguments, uh, for example, the Adams case was one of our cases, and I remember it. Uh, the I remember it, too. I know you do, Judge. Uh, uh, given the uh, propensities of this particular judge, the question occurs to me, will that, be, will that bring about a, a fair and just resolution of the problems of this case? Uh, I, I don't think so, Your Honor, because the judge criticized the reasoning in Adams and, this, and other semen exemption cases um, in fact, I think he characterized them as idiotic. Well, that's, well, that's not that doesn't nice. mean they won't follow it. I mean, I don't, that, that, that seems very well, judge, personalized and inappropriate, but perhaps you, but go ahead. Your Honor, uh, we, uh, at the scheduling conference, the judge asked about what the law was, and I explained to him what my view of the law was <clears> based on this court's jurisprudence, and he said, that's fine, but it's idiotic, and I'm not going to follow it. Those were his words on the record at the scheduling conference. When I was a lawyer and a judge would say that, I would just say, yes, Your Honor. That, which is essentially I'm what I'm not sure what you can say to that. But, then, but, but nonetheless, perhaps the court explained it well enough in this new opinion, um, so it doesn't seem that way anymore to the district court, or whether it seems that way Personally, the district court's not going to not follow the law. We should not assume a judge would not follow the law. Yes, Your Honor, I agree. I, and I, I don't have any indication, um, and I'm, I've never been in the business of predicting anything that a judge would do, and so I don't have any senses. Can you answer my question, the first one? I know we got a little sidetracked. Should we remand for the district court to try to have a chance to apply the governing law? Yes, Your Honor, the court should remand, but Adams didn't change the landscape that dramatically. Um, it relied on decades-old precedent, uh, for example, Coffin versus Blessing Marine. Um, it relied on uh, Dole versus Petroleum Treaters, uh, a case involving cooks on board jack-up vessels who serviced offshore oil and gas rigs, who this court said were likely non-exempt. Is that Martin? Uh, that's. Dole versus Petroleum okay. Treatment. Martin versus Bedell was another case involving cooks, maybe also on uh, Jack Up Riggs. Well, in the district courts, I mean, the, the courts are also under our precedent supposed to, to give a lot of weight to the regulations, right? The DOL regulations? Uh, yes, Your Honor, especially when there's um, an ambiguity in the statute, which um, I actually submit that the regulations go a little, little further than the statutory text does, but they still explain, for example, in 29 CFR 783.34, um, exactly the type of work that even if it's performed on board vessels is not seamen's work. And to a letter, that's exactly what my clients did. Counsel, um, the dissent in Adams, and I know it is a dissent, but it says the panel's decision is novel. Research has not uncovered a single case 
in which a Blue Water crew member, and you know what that is, like the articled mariner plaintiffs here, was held not to be an exempt seaman. Is it your position that your client is something other than a Blue Water crew member? Yes, Your Honor. I mean, he's a, well, he's a cook and a steward. That's a crew member. You have to eat if you're on the ship. You have to eat, yes, Judge, whether or not you're on a ship, you have to eat. Well, on whatever vessel it is. Or on land, you have to eat. Yeah, you have to eat, and so that's your requirement to bring somebody there to fix the meals. Correct, Your Honor. So are you aware of a single case other than Adams, because you said, oh, we may not need to remand because of Adams because it's not different. Are you aware of cases before Adams in which a Blue Water crew member was held not to be an exempt seaman? Your Honor, and I may be misremembering the facts, but I believe that in the Dole v. Petroleum Treaters and Martin v. Bedell, there was at least a fact issue, but the court reasoned that Blue Water crew members might not be seamen in those two cases. So those are your two best cases, this Adams case and that other case? I mean, Judge, they, well, for example, in Martin v. Bedell, this court expressly held that the 20 percent rule applied to cooks on board vessels. And so I think that case is extremely good for us. I also think the Dole case is good, too, because it involved, again, cooks working on vessels who serviced offshore oil and gas rigs, and this court said were likely non-exempt under 13b-6 of the Act. I mean, is there any, so you think one option here is to remand, presumably with maybe an instruction or two for the district court to apply Adams and underlying case law and the regulations to this case. Is there any other option? Your Honor, I think the evidence in the record, if you'll permit me, we responded to the summary judgment motion by doing one thing which I think was very important. We highlighted the fact that on board Helix's vessel at any given time, there were typically 34, there were three crews, essentially, the maritime crew, the well ops crew, and the galley crew. Maritime crew, which undeniably people who are traditional seamen in the ordinary sense of the word, mates, engineers, able-bodied seamen, ordinary seamen, bosuns, there were about 34 of those people on board. There were about 91 oil field workers on board. And so you don't even need to get to the 20 percent rule. Well over half of the crew on board were oil field workers, tool pushers, roustabouts, derrick men. And you had 12 galley workers who prepared food for all of these individuals. Unless there's a serious dispute about the facts from Helix, and that was, I picked one week, but that was a typical kind of arrangement. Unless there's a serious dispute about the facts or the law, I think the court could well render a summary judgment dismissing the exemption defense with prejudice. You want us to render? Of course I do, Judge, but the point is the evidence isn't ... Don't you think that's a little out on a limb? Is Adams itself explained that the district court needs to determine how much time the cook spent preparing food for the crew when they were not performing seamen's work, and how much time they spent preparing food for non-crew members, and you have to figure out whether it's a substantial amount. We can't say that as a matter of law right here today as we sit here on this record, can we? I think you can, Judge. I mean, it doesn't ... Tell me where in the record it says that it's a substantial amount. Well, if you have 12 galley workers preparing meals for 125 people, 91 of whom are oil field workers, it should go without saying that the bulk of their effort goes into preparing food for oil field workers, not seamen. I don't know how else to parse that anymore. I mean, if you're preparing 125 meals or cooking for 125 people, you're obviously spending more time preparing meals for oil field workers than you are maritime workers. Were they performing other seamen's work in addition? No, Your Honor. Because in this other case, in all Adams, that was a question, too. It was, Your Honor, and the cooks ... The Adams case on that fact is a little distinguishable because those folks 
when they weren't cooking they were actually otherwise engaged at these the stewards in the cooks in this case that was their full time job was cooking they were not chip and paint or tending lines or taking on goods or services or meeting a tender out somewhere it's all they were doing was cooking or cleaning in the case of stewards anything else you want to point out your honor I would like to point out two things one this court has held over and over again that cooking and cleaning is not goes to what we were talking about not inherently semen or non semen's work because it depends on the context in which it's performed and you know for again the rule is if cooks spend more than 20% of their time preparing food for workers who are not involved in the navigation of the vessel then they're not semen that's Martin versus Bedell Adams versus all coast Owens versus Sea River Dole versus petroleum treaters it's about as settled as it gets you want this to be exactly the inquiry that the dissent in Adams said is unwieldy yes your honor if I majority must not have taken that view right and I think it was a third 13 to 2 yeah but I mean but the majority didn't they just said they give no guidance to the district court is the district court supposed to do this and so it's right but this they didn't give guidance to the district court and so but you want us to do it here as a court of appeals go through that and determine it and so your honor I respectfully I think this court has already said in other cases that the 20% rule is the law especially with respect to semen I think there's that's the Martin versus Bedell case and then Owens and versus Sea River the court pointed out in a footnote I think that they expressly approved of the holding in Martin with respect to the 20% rule and percent is a guideline not a rule isn't it your honor this court has adopted it as the rule in both Owens and Martin versus Bedell first Martin then Owens I don't think there's any wiggle room at least based on this course jurisprudence as it currently exists the and I do want to take a moment to address this argument that the rule is unworkable or unwieldy that is simply not true your honor it and I don't think I'm oversimplifying this but if you're cooking for a hundred people the majority of whom are not semen then as a proposition of law logic and common sense you're spending more of your time cooking for non semen there's no dispute that that's exactly what happened in this case whether or not if you're making a batch of spaghetti you still got to make the batch of spaghetti whether you make a big batch or a small batch I mean I'm not sure incrementally the time is based upon the number of people you know the other thing that that's true the other thing I'd like to point out though this is an affirmative defense not my burden to show anything helix made no effort in their summary judgment motion to explain the the composition of the crew or to argue that they the cooks prepared more food for semen than non semen or vice versa they simply proceeded straight to criticizing the laws unworkable and even if it was they didn't carry their burden to show that they were entitled to summary judgment because they had offered no facts in support of its defense especially in light of the cases we've talked about Martin Dole Adams Owens those types of cases for these reasons and we would ask the court to at a minimum reverse the district courts grant of summary judgment and remand the case thank you thank you your honor here don't you your honor I frequently find myself in that situation and maybe that's just my lot in life but 
May it please the court. I would like to, to mention very briefly why I think the summary judgment was proper. And then I'd like to pivot and turn to this 80-20 rule and the Encino motor cars case. Because uh, all the lawyers in this room deal in this area of the law a lot. And the Supreme Court came out with the Encino motor, cor motor cars opinion a few years ago. But the Fifth Circuit has yet to really address the application of that case to the jurisprudence in this circuit. And, and that is desperately needed. And I think there's particular application there to, to this 80-20 regulation. So first I'll say that summary judgment was proper because it was our burden to prove and we did prove that McKnight and the other plaintiffs were employed subject to the authority, direction, and control of the master. There's no dispute about that. There's also no dispute that the steward services performed by the plaintiffs were rendered pr primarily as an aid to the, the operation of the vessel as a means of transportation and that the vessel could not operate as a means of transportation without the cooking and food service and cleaning that they, that they performed. So under the, I would say under the Gale case uh, from 1940 that's it's been the law in this circuit, it's been reaffirmed as good law, we definitely met the standard in Gale. And I know there may be some more questions about these other cases, but first let me say, with respect to the Encino Motor Cars case in 2018, uh, which again has never really been addressed by the Fifth Circuit that I am aware of. It's been mentioned, it has been cited, but it's, ne it's never really been explained how that case is, has, should impact the jurisprudence. So let's talk a little bit about the statute and the regulations, which of course are the first places to start. The FLSA was passed in 1938. The first uh, regulations were promulgated by the DOL in 1939. I think Mr. McKnight and the plaintiffs clearly met the seaman definition of those regulations at the time they were promulgated. Now, in 1948, years later, the DOL, uh, DOL promulgated regulation 783.37, which is the 80-20 rule. I believe that loan regulation arose as a result of a Supreme Court opinion, which is the A.H. Phillips versus Walling case that said uh, the FLSA exemption should be narrowly construed. So that, that opinion came out in 45. The, this new regulation came out three years later in 48. Decisions prior to 48, like the Gale case in this circuit in 1940, I'm sorry, in 1940, they appear to use a fair reading construction, like as discussed in Encino, and they seem to adopt a primary duty rule for the exemption, which is the same rule that is generally applied in the majority of the FLSA exemptions, like the white collar exemptions. After uh, 783.37 in 1948, Courts then mentioned the need to construe the FLSA exemptions narrowly, and they adopt this 80-20 rule as a result of this new regulation. And that, it, that regulation, 80-20, is, cons, it is consistent with a narrow construction viewpoint of these exemptions. Okay. Is the regulation, as you're saying? I'm sorry. The regulation. The regulation is consistent. Is consistent with the of the. It's consistent with the notion that the statute itself, the exemption in the statute, employed as a seaman, needs to be narrowly construed. Are you suggesting then that the regulation is uh, shouldn't receive Chevron deference, or is, is, is that is that? Uh, I, I, yes, I am. I'm. I'm. I'm suggesting that I think that regulation is inconsistent with a fair reading of the statute and in fact does violence to the statute. As mentioned in Encino, which says instead of giving a narrow construction to uh, the exemption itself in the statute, there must be a fair reading of the exemption itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that... Can you do that on a panel or you think you need to go back again on Bonk, Mr. Crow? I think that um, I think there's an opinion by this court discussing this issue very recently. I think this uh, the Bonneville Marine Service opinion by Judge Engelhart discusses this issue, and he talks about 
if there's been an intervening supreme court opinion that implicitly may impact prior opinions of this court then this court and till and till the court addresses that intervening supreme court opinion it's fair game and and it can be addressed by uh a panel of this court so i'll have to go back and reread what judge inglehart wrote in that case my understanding of our rule of orderliness is that this a, an intervening supreme court decision has to explicitly overrule so to speak uh, one of our decisions in order for a panel to feel that it's not bound by the rule of orderliness isn't that right so I, it has to be more than an implication i think i think what th this opinion says is in basic terms when a fifth circuit precedent th and this is talking about in, overruling a Fifth Circuit precedent, but when it says, when a Fifth Circuit precedent is implicitly overruled in a subsequent Supreme Court opinion, uh, which establishes a rule of law inconsistent with that precedent, one situation in which this may naturally occur is where a intervening Supreme Court decision fundamentally changes the focus of the relevant analysis. I think that's what Encino does here. It fundamentally changes the focus of this analysis, because because I wouldn't. Don't we have opinions, Adams being the prime example, that come after Encino Motor Cars that don't reach that conclusion? It does, but this this opinion goes on to state that even if there are opinions like Adams that come out after Encino, if the if the Fifth Circuit has not addressed Encino, okay? The issues in Encino can still be raised. I'm familiar with Judge Inglehart's opinion in that case, uh, but I'm wondering, in, in Adams, I, I don't recall this right off the top of my head, did people make the Encino argument? They did not. Okay. No, did no none of the parties, did Miki make the argument maybe? Uh, uh, well, I can say Encino maybe. may have been cited. There is no discussion in the Adams opinion. No, the opinion doesn't, but did the parties cite it and just no? I think it may have been cited. I think it may have been cited. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, Judge Jones's dissent from denial of en banc rehearing discusses Encino right at the outset. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, just, I'm just trying to understand the argument that because Encino says we should look at the exemptions in a different way, but the reg is still there, the 80-20 yes. reg is there. It is still there. We, we would need a reason to uh, feel, not, feel that we're not bound by the reg. Yeah. It sounds like a Chevron. I mean, DOL promulgated the reg in interpretation of the statute, right? Yes. It's a Chevron argument. Yes, and, and, and thus, um, the, the, the issue in my view then is does the, does the regulation do violence to the, to the proper interpretation of the statute? You know, I, I, I get that. I mean, maybe that, maybe that argument has some legs to it. I'm just not sure we can do that, uh, in light of Adams. Well, in, in this in recent opinion by Judge Englehart, he talks about, he says, Ours is the first Fifth Circuit panel to squarely address the, the issue at hand in light of this new Supreme Court authority. What was the, what, I, I just don't remember, what was, what was the statute or the regulation at issue in that case? The, the, um, I'm, I've got that opinion, I'm sorry, I'm not exactly it, it's sure. My, I guess my point is, it, it, was, it wasn't an, uh, was it It was an not FLSA? the FLSA. Okay, it wasn't FLSA. No, it was not. Okay. No, Your Honor. But it did say implicit, not... Implicit, yes. It says that, yes. Yeah, and he talks about if a, if a Fifth Circuit panel has not squarely addressed the issue, then it can be addressed. So what, it, would, you, what would you want us to do here today? So, Your Honor, we, we're asking that the district court uh, opinion be affirmed because I, I do think that... Um, I do think that this 80-20 analysis that is the driver in Martin and it is the driver in Allcoast is a clear um, 
it's clearly driven by that eighty twenty analysis it is clearly driven by this narrow construction notion is that what judge hughes applied in this case he applied the gale case which was the the seminal case in this area since 1940 and it's been reaffirmed in the sea river maritime case for example and and uh i think also in the coffin versus blessy case it's been affirmed again and again as as good law it is also frankly much more consistent with the jurisprudence of other federal circuits than than like the seventh circuit judge poser's written an excellent opinion on the the semen exemption which is crystal clear and very different from the jurisprudence in this court very but very similar to the gale you know if there's been any circuit court that has followed this line on encino and said that the regulation the 80 20 regulation is really i know goes beyond the statute of course i'd be talking about that if sure sure yeah but i i am not aware of that but you have to so the the notion before that is in martin that is in all coast is that the statute has a remedial purpose and so we don't want this we don't want there to be very many exempt people we want to narrowly construe it to keep as many people from complying with the exemptions and that drives i mean that's got to drive this analysis about how even though the same duty of cleaning or preparing food has got to be parsed in terms of who is it going to be prepared for a member of the vessel crew or a member of the marine crew so it's the exact same duty and the question is who is it prepared for i will tell you that notion is not expressed in any of the other regs do you know whether um i i, I you weren't counsel in adams were you no um do you know whether cert has has been sought in that case i guess the time is still open i think the time is still open in that case and i don't know um but your honor this notion that that we have to look at who the food is prepared for that is not consistent with the regulations i don't think that is consistent with a fair construction of of the statute itself that says someone who is employed as a seaman but but mr crow even if i agree with you that seems to be what adam says has to happen i agree i agree and, and and I will say I'll say something else that gives me concern, and part of the reason, if 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 this court does not affirm, and it remands, we I think we desperately I think all the lawyers who practice in this area desperately need guidance from the Fifth Circuit on what Encino does, because the earlier opinions from the Fifth Circuit that deal with the 80-20 rule, like the Sea River Maritime case, they say, well, it is a guideline, like like you mentioned, Judge Elrod. So it's just a guideline. In the Sea River case, they just mention it in a footnote. They don't really, it's not really part of the core analysis of the court. But in Martin, and definitely in all coasts, it stops looking like a guideline and starts looking like a hard and fast rule. It starts looking like it's being mechanically uh, applied. And so, a lot going on here. We've got our rule of orderliness. We've got Judge Engelhardt's guidelines. We've got our rule of orderliness on the the Gale case and on the Adams case. And we are going to have to figure out how to navigate those that those that to synthesize, to synthesize it. Did you have something else you wanted to teach us or ask us about or? You know, I just, I just, I just note this from uh, the Encino case that says the narrow construction principle, which precedes the analysis in all these these cases that the plans rely on, that principle relies on the fraud, flawed premise that the FLSA pursues its remedial purpose at all costs, but the FLSA has two dozen exemptions in 13b alone including the one at issue here those exemptions are as much a part of the FLA, FLSA's purpose as the overtime pay requirement uh, we have thus no license but to give the exemption anything but a fair reading so th that I, I believe is a watershed ruling from the U.S. Supreme Court in terms of the proper construction of this statute and and um, 
it's we we desperately we desperately need guidance on that point oh i do have a question you're opposing counsel your friend on the other side says that um that this case is just all the facts are on one side and we don't even need to say there needs to be a trial because we could do it ourselves because you just do not put forth facts and the facts are pretty undisputed and so you automatically lose on the facts do you want to talk about that yes thank you your honor so again i i think their argument arises from this notion that i mentioned of the 80 20 rule is not a guideline it's not part of the mix to be considered but it must be mechanically applied is what they say but I think, which is flawed in my view, and, and you lose if we apply the 80-20 mechanically on the situation of your clients. Here. We do. We should not, Your Honor. And and the reason why we should not is because the the plaintiffs in this case, um, their argument is that well, all you need to look at is is the number of people on board the vessel, and that should dictate. The, the outcome. That is not at all what the All Coast case says or the Martin case says. They say you have to look at the incremental amount of time, which they did not put any evidence in the record on that point at all. So instead of saying, well, I'm cooking, this case is cooks or stewards or? It, well, All Coast is all cooks. Yeah. The, these people claim to be stewards, which, which they weren't the same as cooks, but they assisted in food preparation and then they had cleaning duties. So what, what Mr. Um, Hess is saying is that we look at the composition of the crew, we see fewer, far fewer seamen versus non-seamen, and so the only, the only plausible, the only possible outcome is, you know, they're, they're servicing, they're serving uh, non-seamen sub substantially, and, and you're saying we shouldn't look at just the composition of the crew, we should look beyond that? I, I, would, I would definitely say, I would, I would say the incremental amount of time well, I, I would say that that under traditional uh, uh, the viewpoint of a traditional semen analysis at the time the statute was passed, you had people who were acting as cooks and stewards who were performing those duties both for the marine and the non-marine crew and passengers. And they were all considered to be semen at the time the statute was passed, and I think that is really especially under Encino, that is the relevant analysis. Well, I get that, but that, that kind of goes to your argument for, for rethinking precedent. Well, I think what Judge Elrod is asking is about the facts of this case and whether they're material fact disputes, even if uh, the precedent is, a, assuming precedent is as it is. Well, if you assume precedent as it is, again, they've, they've not put any, and they could have, I mean, they had a client who could have sworn an affidavit that says, talks about the incremental amount of time, they didn't do that. They didn't address the amount of time spent cleaning at all. Cleaning is probably the dominant duty of these workers. There's no evidence in the record by the plaintiff on that point. Okay. Uh, You're saying there are fact disputes. There, there. This is not a. Pro, it would not be it, appropriate for us. To even under all coast, even under all coast, there definitely would be factual disputes. And I, I think that that there's other issues to be that have to be considered, and that is the merchant marine credentials of all these people, which definitely weighs on our side. I think uh, other duties that they may have performed that are more marine in character, which you see as a part of the more traditional analysis of this circuit that, that factors all of these things in, N that stuff is not in the record and and would, ha would need to be addressed. Is discovery over in this case? I assume it is, right? W uh, was it? Well, there, there was limited discovery in this case, and, um, and there, there's, there's no reason why if, if we get remanded, if the court decides that's the right thing to do, why additional discovery couldn't be taken. Thank you, Your Honor. Sir, <clears throat> this being the only case to be argued with, we've reached the conclusion of our work well, it's here. May I re Pardon me? Maybe rebuttal. I'm sorry. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being too fast. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Go ahead. I, I do want to address this Encino Motor Cars argument that Mr. Crow spent a significant amount of time discussing was not ever raised in the briefs. 
Um, in fact, I don't. I just looked at his table of authorities. And I don't see the case. I think he should not have done that without having raised it. Are you asking us to let you address it or something? Your Honor, I'm happy to do it now because uh, on the record, but he didn't raise it in the briefs. Okay. Um, that, that's a good point. If, I mean, it, if that's accurate, then that's a good point, and you're supposed to not argue out of your briefs unless you, yeah. So, thank you. Um, Even yes. If it were before us, I mean, could, could we do that in light of Adams? Um, your Honor, as to this exemption, the Encino Motors car ship has sailed. Um, to your question, uh, Judge Elrod, it was heavily litigated in the Adams case. I remember uh, the, the uh, Appleese raised it, uh, the Amici raised it. Um, <clears throat> the majority didn't raise it, only the dissent. Well, presumably. They didn't talk about it at all, the majority. That, that's true, Your Honor, but presumably. Um, the majority was, I, I know they were aware of the decision, and, they, and I'm sure it guided the opinion. Um, the other issue is, th this is all an interesting argument, but it's not even a close call in this case. Maybe the 80-20 rule is bad policy. Maybe the rule should be changed. Maybe we should do something different. Is it a rule? Maybe it's a guideline. Maybe it's a guideline. I think, though, this court has expressly characterized it as a rule um, in Martin versus Bedell and then subsequently in, in the Coffin case. Did it have a could it depart from the Gale, if, if it Gale and the C, is it C, the other case it said it was a guideline? I'm just trying to trace our rule of orderliness back to the first case. Right, Your Honor. Um, could it depart from Gale? If that's controlling, then probably not. But again, this isn't a situation where it, it's, a, it's on the line like it was in Adams. The majority, I mean, we have to pick something. As, as a cutoff. Is it 80, 20? Is it 50? Is it 75? The overwhelming majority of people on board a Helix vessel are not maritime workers. So this is all fine, but even if you adopted a different cutoff, say 50 percent, the result wouldn't be any different. You cleaning, we, you know, we call a steward, we think of a, kind of like a cruise ship, a cabin steward or something. Is a steward that's cleaning in this context, cleaning the the vessel itself all over the place in the common areas or only cleaning? I'm sorry, I guess I should know this, but I'm sorry I don't. Um, Your Honor, uh, typically they're, they're cleaning staterooms and common areas like eating areas. The common areas too, is that, a, but is that a bigger portion? So they'd have to clean the common areas anyway, even if they were, do you see what I'm saying? It's, yeah, yes, Your Honor. Um, no, if it's just rooms and you might say, well, there's rooms of this many people versus this many people. But if it's common areas, it would have to be clean regardless of the number. True. Uh, you, I do want to say one thing, though, to your question and related to my response. There was no discovery in this case. Judge, the judge entered a form order at the inception of the case prohibiting all discovery as a matter of course. Um, we asked for some limited discovery under Rule 56D. It was minimally granted. I got some crew manifest. Um, and so. These are all excellent fact, fact issues that we should be able to develop through discovery, which we were prohibited from doing in the first place. That said, uh, Mr. Crow mentioned that I didn't offer any evidence about uh, the exemption and, and, and uh, related facts. Excuse me? Incremental time. Right. Again, this is not my burden. They bear the burden. They bear the burden. He says that, the other, which I think is still good law, at least in part. <laughs> and. Um, also, we talked a little bit in, in both my argument and uh, Mr. Crow's arguments about adopting a persons on board approach. Uh, that was exactly the criticism that was advanced by All Coast in its petition for rehearing on Bonk. They said this persons on board, what All Coast, what the opinion does is it requires us to look at the persons on board. That's what the amici said in support of the petition for rehearing on back, because that's what All Coast did. It requires us to look to the people for whom you're cooking or cleaning to determine whether or not it's Siemens work. Uh, one last point, Your Honor, related to all these issues. A fine place to start with analyzing an exemption is the statutory text. It says employees employed as Siemens. If you were to go down the street to the 8th District Coast Guard headquarters and ask an enlisted person or an admiral there if a cook was a seaman, 
he'd say no he's not a seaman the dictionary if you look up the word seaman it says a person whose business is navigating vessels doesn't include cooks we've got quickly we've had a much broader understanding of who is the semen under the jones act perhaps but um i think if you would ask any merchant mariner any coast guardsman any naval officer uh, if a cook was a seaman they'd say no because they're not on, on the deck when the when the weather gets bad you know holding down the lines or making sure stuff doesn't go overboard i'm a seaman because i do that dangerous type work um, and if we're going and if the supreme court has taught us anything recently it's that the text the words take on their ordinary meaning at the time when congress passed the statute uh thank you i have nothing else thank you thank you mr yes. We did refer to the Encino case in our 28J letter that, that is in the record. Thank you. This being the uh, only case for the day, this court will adjourn without date. And uh, the panel will...